Buenos días, muchísimas gracias a todos. Gracias, bueno, primero de todo, un aplauso para la organización, que de verdad está muy buen el evento, muy bien organizado. Hola. Muchísimas gracias a vosotros también por estar aquí un sábado por la mañana, que bueno, ya sabemos que es un poco durillo, ¿no? Eh, así que nada, muchísimas gracias a todos. Eh, bueno, eh, con esta menuda cara de alemán, ya sabéis que cambiaré el inglés, ¿no? Entonces me encuentro un poco más cómodo así, pero me imagino que ya los esperéis. Eh, so, switching to English now. And uh, today I'm going to talk about my experience at Sentmate, uh, building a more cohesive C team. I'm going to talk about uh, practices that I have put in place in a very uh, informal way to uh, build an even, even stronger uh, C-level team. So, a um, bit of a disclaimer. I might ask you all a couple of questions just to you know, break the ice, but don't feel forced to answer to anything because uh, you know, let's, let's keep it a safe environment for everyone. And uh, emojis will be overused in this presentation. So, by a raise of hands, do your teams do sprints? Anyone? Sprints? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, retros? Retrospective? Yeah? Okay, good. I, I, by the way, I love retrospectives. Uh, what about team buildings? Do you do team buildings? Okay, a little bit of less hands. Now, here comes a tricky question. Does your sea level do any of this? Not so many hands, okay. Kudos for the, for the ones that do, that do. So this is what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about practices that we ask our teams to, to do, to put in place, while at the same time, we don't do the same to our teams. I mean, when we work at CTOs, we operate at, in two axes, right? We, on the vertical axis, we have the people that report to ourselves, but we also operate at a more horizontal level. We are also part of a team, the C team. Now, so why do we ask our teams to put those things in place or put those practices in place? And why do we forget about ourselves? Why do we don't do the dog foodie? So this is what I'm gonna talk about today. So who am I and what's in it for you? Uh, this talk is gonna be about uh, practices and insights from acting as a very informal coach at Sentmate. Uh, Sentmate is a startup fragrance house uh, based in Barcelona. Uh, it's part of well, perfumery, perfumery industry, which was very new for me uh, two years ago when I joined Sentmate. So I, my role is engineering lead at Sentmate. And a couple of things about myself. So I'm awful at taking pictures. My girlfriend's here, she can confirm that. Every, she loves taking pictures. And uh, every time we take pictures, she's like, Felipe, smile for the picture. I'm like, I'm trying to smile for the picture. What are you talking about? Oh, I'm awful at taking pictures. I'm much more comfortable in pictures like this, where I don't actually need to look at the camera. Is, is it true or not? Yeah, she can confirm that. <laughs> and it's my first time at the topmost position of an engineering hierarchy. Uh, here in St. Mate. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, my experience trying to build a more cohesive C team. So we're going to talk about teams. And I don't know about yourself, but uh, when I talk about teams, the first image that comes to my mind is something like this. A bunch of people putting their hands together and say, yeah, one, two, three, let's go. Let's build something. Let's get something done. Let's get, deliver something. Let's, you know, let's build it. But most of my experience seems actually more like this. Because people, they are so different. Every head is a different world. It's a completely different universe. So understanding how, what motivates someone, what makes them go the extra step, what, how to get the best out of people and build an actual high-performing team out of those people, it's a whole different deal. So I, was, I looked at my, at my C team and I was like, okay, I can see we could improve collaboration among ourselves. So how can we transition from this to that? How can we go from a puzzle of different pieces and reach a point where we actually fit each other and build a greater picture? 
A little bit of context about our C team. Well, first of all, we are five department leads. So I'm the lead of engineer, engineering. There are another four leads. We all report to our general manager. And it's quite a diverse team in the sense that we have a mix of tenures in uh, perfumery, perfumery industry. You're going to see me struggle a lot with this word today. <laughs> and uh, also a bit of mixed backgrounds. We have people that spend all their life working in, with, uh, with, in this industry, uh, coming from big corps. Uh, we had people like myself that came from mostly tech startups and also a different mix of uh, tenures and expertise when it comes to uh, agile practices. So it was a very interesting mix that gave room for a lot of experimentation. And the good thing about this team is that they are really open for experimenting. So it was actually quite easy for me to uh, put in place the practices that I'm gonna share today. So what were my goals with this work, with building? Uh, what, what did I want to achieve in phases? So the first thing I wanted to achieve was creating trust among yourselves, among ourselves, because trust is the base for everything, in my, in my opinion. Um, I wanted to create trust with other goals in mind. The second, the second goal I had in mind was fostering commitment. So let's first create a base of trust, and then we can commit to, uh, to each other. Once we are committed enough to each other, we can actually uh, in, uh, hold each other as, uh, hold each other accountable for things. Once we have trust and we're committed to each other, we can have conversations like, "Hey, this is doing really, this is going really well, and on this thing here, there's room for improvement. Now, what can we do? At, uh, what can we do at, uh, about it? Once you have trust, and people understand that you're coming from a good place, you're coming from a positive place. You, they understand that your your goal is not to criticize anyone, but actually to get the best for the business." Because in the end, my ultimate goal was getting results faster. Um, so it's, you can't go from A to Z in just one step. You have there are building blocks all over this path, and to achieve faster results, there are some things you need to put in place before. So all of this might ring a bell if you've read this book before, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's a book that has heavily influenced myself along this path. I really, really liked it. So if you ever read this book, you might recognize some of the, the ideas that I'm going to share here. So I'm here to talk about practices. So um, how did I structure those practices? I, I organized those practices under four pillars. The first one was about breaking the ice, so get to know each other as humans. The second one, second one, setting baselines, because we cannot try and say, uh, tell someone you're not doing something well enough if you haven't established what well enough means. Third one, re constantly reminding ourselves that we are working with humans. And the fourth topic, the fourth pillar, working in cycles. Because we wanted to, I wanted to, to, work, to bring uh, the C team as close as possible to agile practices which in the end are very much related with the PDC, PDCA cycles. So first pillar, breaking the ice. What were my goals with this? I wanted to introduce leads to each other as people. I mean, we had been working for almost two years together and we barely knew each other. There were people that had more frequent collaboration like myself and the product lead and we knew a lot about each other and our collaboration was quite, quite smooth. But with other, with other people in the team, we barely knew anything about each other. So to create a base of trust, we had to, to know each other as humans before. And getting to know each other at a personal level also, uh, also leads to opening the door to honest feedback in a safe way. Why do we want to do that? To have honest, uh, honest feedback in a safe way and uh, introducing each other so that we can have um, a smoother collaboration. So what kind of practices did we put in place? First one, retrospectives. So most of our C team, the first time I ran a retrospective, they had never done it before. And it was quite a change. The whole idea of them being able to talk about how to improve things in a safe way without pointing fingers and actually getting action items out of it without anyone feeling bad was a game changer. And then the, na the next thing we did was introducing speedback. So for those who are not familiar with it, it's 
a quick session for exchanging feedback in a speed dating format. So five minutes slot, and then you go in a kind of like a round robin format. And this was mind blowing. When we came out of our first feedback session, our general manager was like, oh my God, we got to do this every month. I was like, yeah, go for it. So these two, they're a good game changer. They opened the doors to recognizing the humans inside, uh, inside of each of us and for creating much better collaborations. The second pillar was setting baselines. So what, what were my goals with this? Uh, the first one, establishing metrics and fundamental agreements. Why? Because without metrics and agreements, we cannot hold each other accountable for anything. If we don't know where we're coming from, we cannot, you know, cannot, cannot say to someone, okay, this is how far you're good, this is how far you are from good enough. First, we need to define what good enough means. And by holding each other accountable, we also help fostering um, commitment. So what kind of practices did we put in place? The first one, establishing a social contract within the team. Social contract can be a bit of an abstract concept, but it, it's just having a quick session or a conversation about what kind of behaviors do we want to foster in a team or not, like being on time for meetings, um, I don't know, do not send emails after 6 p.m., but, but also positive things like let, let's, let's be fair or let's try and be as fair as possible, let's try and be optimistic about things. So it's really a conversation to have among people within a team, it doesn't need to be a C team. And also to establish expectations among each other. So what kind of conversations did we have here? It's, it's very basic stuff, just saying like, this is what you can expect from me, this is what you cannot expect from me, and this is what I expect from each, uh, from each of you in this team. Once you have those, you have the baselines. Then you have margin to have conversations like, hey, I sent you an email yesterday at 7 p.m. You didn't reply it yet. And I can come back to this person and say, hey, this is not our baseline. We have set as a baseline that uh, we're not expected to answer emails after 6 p.m. It's still 9 a.m. I haven't had time to go through it. So it, it smoothens a lot the interactions among people within the team. And also to establish success metrics. That's that was our last um, our last practice there. So, what does it actually mean uh, to be successful as a leadership team? Because when we are engineers, it's quite easy in the sense that we have lots of information confirming or telling how good we're doing. If the if the, if the test suite passes, it means we're doing good. If the pipeline goes well and puts the latest change to production it means we're doing good if we had no incidents over the last over the last month it means we're doing good but as a leadership team what does what does it mean to be successful well, what kind of metrics or what kind of signals can we do we have to tell us uh, we are doing good or not so in in more specific terms when it comes to success metrics one thing we did was creating uh, what we call happiness survey. It's a survey that we fire once every two months uh, on a regular basis. Every two months we, we fire again and again and again to assess uh, the routine of people in the team. So we assess aspects like autonomy, uh, recognition, payment, productivity of meetings, anything that can influence people's routine. And they, this, happiness, this happiness survey has given us lots of great insights about how, what and how to improve things. Of course, also we have space for open feedback, and this has led to very interesting situations where we had, uh, all of a sudden we had a team uh, that had really low scores, and then you have the leader of, the, of this team knowing that, hey, okay, I need to work on autonomy of my team over the last quarter or, or over the next two months. And then after two months, you run the survey again, and you see the improvements, that's really motivating. So this creates a virtuous circle uh, in which people want to do it over and over and over again because they see the results for what they're doing, they get the feedback. And uh, of course, it's a different feedback, feedback loop. We're talking different lead times, but still, after so much hard work, seeing that it paid off, it creates a lot of motivation. 
third pillar, working with humans. So what were my goals with those practices? First, I wanted to create space for casual and non-work conversations because leads, they can be quite busy. And uh, quite often it's hard to find space on someone's calendars to just have a, to just have a conversation or even to, to have a business related conversation, it can be quite hard. All of a sudden you have an urgent topic and then you do have, you need to do calendar Tetris, trying to find a spot that works for everyone that you need in that, that call. So it can be it can be tricky. I wanted to create space for any kind of conversations, work related or non work related, and also creating experience, uh, creating uh, space for sharing experiences. I mean, different people go through different kinds of problems throughout life. Uh, for me, yeah, I had some very particular situations, and at some moment. I was wondering if anyone else had gone through the same, if anyone else had a person in that team going through that curse, uh, that kind of personal situation. Like, I don't know, I have a person in my team who broke up uh, with his girlfriend, had uh, that thing heavily influenced on his performance as well, and also on his mental routine. So perhaps someone else in the leadership team had gone, th had, had a people, had a person going through the same. So how do they go about it? How do they solve this kind of problem? And also making leads accessible to each other, because as I said, finding time to talk with a with a person in a leadership position can be tricky uh, at times, and this might lead to a perception of, hey, this person is not accessible, this person is grumpy. When it's just a matter of perception, it's all in our heads. This person might might be so busy that uh, that person might not even have the chance to say, hey, I'm here, I'm here for you. I want to listen to you. So I wanted to create space for all of this. So in my, what kind of practices do we use? It might sound counterintuitive, but the first thing we do was having a reserved slot for impromptu conversations. So every Wednesday, 11 to 12, uh, leads are available to each other. So if you have an urgent matter to discuss, or if you perhaps you just want to catch up, our calendars are blocked at every Wednesday at 11. And the second thing we did was fostering also uh, informal interactions. So our uh, reserved slot for having lunch together, for having coffee together, that's something that we did. So every Thursday at nine, you're going to find leads in the cafeteria having a, having a coffee and talking about life. Same thing every Tuesday, at one, you're going to find uh, leads in the restaurant have, uh, having lunch together, as any other team would do. Last but not least, working in cycles. So we wanted to avoid that leadership tasks got forgotten due to other priors. It's very common for leaders to focus so much on what others are asking from them and forgetting that we are also individual contributors. So we also have things that we cannot delegate to, to anyone else and we, net, we need to get that, that thing done. So instead of just lying there forever and never done, um, we wanted to at least get it done because, I mean, if it takes three weeks to, three weeks to get done, it's still faster than never getting done. So we wanted to work in cycles so that we would continuously review what's going on, what kind of tasks do we have in progress, and when are we going to get them done. And we also wanted to create a dedicated space to review strategy and business priors on a regular basis. So how did we, how, how did we do that? We introduced kind of like a sprint planning. And as I said, times are different when, uh, when you talk about a leads team. So our, our sprint uh, lasts a month. And instead of doing a, uh, a daily review of tasks, we did a weekly re review. So every Monday, uh, we have a Slack reminder telling us, hey, do you have anything to, uh, to update? Every Tuesday, we do an in-person update, checking, double checking the tasks, see if there's anything blocked, if anyone needs help getting moving something that is in progress. And uh, we also implement, started doing quarterly retreats. So every three months, we get together to discuss strategy, to discuss metrics, KPIs, and uh, what do we want to do next. So to wrap up, uh, a couple of insights and tips in case you're interested in doing the same. 
Um, the first one, it's a long journey. Uh, be sure to remember why you're doing this, because at times you might get frustrated and end up forgetting well, why, why did you start doing this in the first place. Second advice, don't make it your top priority. Uh, it takes time for people to get used to, to different ways of working. So it's, as I said before, it's a long journey. Don't make it a top prior. Keep it as a side project, as, at least in the beginning. That's that would be my my advice uh, to avoid uh, avoid frustration uh, mounting up too much. Third advice: uh, find a first follower. It's much easier for someone to follow your ideas if they see that someone else that is close enough to them is also joining that new initiative. And if you can find that first follower among uh, leadership, it's even better because then people would much more naturally uh, follow it. And always, always, always start small. If you start small enough, it's easier for people to accept. It's easier for people to, to, to digest. So don't over, over engineer it. Go piece by piece, but don't forget about the long run. And last piece of advice, you for sure are going to face resistance when you try to introduce new things at your leadership team. But keep going. I mean, try things out, even if you, if you, even if you face resistance. Start small, find a first follower, and give it a try. And, you know, uh, people most likely will be willing to give you one hour of their time or so to try something new. My usual approach is saying, like, oh, okay, Perhaps it's not easy to understand right now, but how about we give it a try just for an hour? If you don't like it, it's fine. We'll never do it again. But can I have one hour of your time? And usually it works. And uh, luckily, uh, most times people were happy with the experience and wanted to continue doing it even more. And that's it. So thank you very much.